Well, I don't expect to be able to give John's lecture because I really do not know what he intended to say. But I will try to improvise a little on the theme of this factor of communication in regard to mental and physical ailments. I think that perhaps the Chinese have given us some very good background material. They recognize nature as the great instructor. They recognize the mountains and the rivers and the valleys, the flowers and the trees and the birds and everything that exists in nature as naturally having a benevolent influence. When we get worldly weary, we often escape to the country uh, to some retreat where we can rest in the presence of a tremendous ministry of natural value, which is not accompanied by any verbal instruction. Nature does not teach by words. It does not preach to us in verbalizations. It rather simply exists as it is. And we find this existence as it is very desirable, very helpful, and revitalizing after the pressures of confusion. Therefore, we may say in the Chinese way of thinking that the more we live with the confusions of humanity, the more weary and sick we are apt to become, and that our greatest position is nature itself. That nature, in its own proper way, asks to be understood and interpreted. It is up to us, really, to discover the values in nature. But one of the reasons why we are impelled to do this is because we already experience or feel some quality, some value that we cannot find in the congestion of human relationships. The Sung, the Sung painters, the Sumi masters of both Japan and China have given us wonderful pictorial scenes which reach into our natures so that actually a picture is a sermon without words. It tells us something. We experience inwardly. It stimulates our intuitive reaction and becomes a bomb in Gilead. We feel better, more peaceful, for the painting becomes a window into a universal existence. Now we realize in some way that the more natural we can be in a constructive sense, the better our health is apt to be. Anything that is artificial or sophisticated endangers our peace of mind and also the harmony of our bodily functions. If, therefore, we recognize that the universe in which we live is continually communicating with us, not with words or preachments, but with the mere fact of its own statement of existence, what it is, what it does, what it means. Now, in a smaller but very personal way, the human body also communicates with us at all times. We do not necessarily recognize this communication. In fact, in many instances, we know it only as a pain reflex in which a troubled body is trying to express the urgency of its needs. On the other hand, the normal, healthy body communicates as nature does simply by the adequacy of itself, by the fact that it becomes a useful and patient protector of our purposes and contributes to the fulfillment of our various objectives. The ancients, therefore, regarded the body with great reverence. They considered it to be a proper symbol of the divine order and the divine harmony. Uh, like the universe, it does not necessarily verbalize anything. 
but it does in one way or another express itself, sometimes through symbolism, sometimes through reflexes, sometimes through symptoms which require careful consideration. Therefore, the body, again, is another instrument of nonverbal communication. And this is, perhaps, the grand term to cover all of the examples of life that become our teachers. Examples that are not put into words, do not appear in textbooks, but which continuously influence us. The human being, by nature, is natural. He is part of the world in which he lives. But gradually, the average person has alienated uh, natural pressures and, certain, and circumstances. He has built cities in which the communication factor is seriously offended. He moves into congestion. He lives under a, ver a variety of pressures most of which are against the well-being of his own nature. Some of these pressures damage his body, others outrage his emotions, and others again afflict his thoughts. But nearly all the problems that afflict us are artificial. They arise from mutual ignorance, indifference, or unreasonable ambition. Some of them rise from the facts that we cannot get over grudges, cannot forgive our enemies, and cannot tolerate the success of other people. All of these different pressures move in. They also are, for the most part, nonverbal. They may be communicated to us by other persons, watched over television programs, or read in the press. But still, the circumstance itself is not speaking. It is not telling us something. But in the various media, this circumstance is already conditioned. The media does not tell us the real emotional core of a situation. It interprets it already. And we begin to accept the interpretations and are variously influenced not by the circumstances, but by the way other people have reacted to them. If reactions are artificial, they again become a nonverbal source of tension and stress. Today we have a great deal of bad health, and at the same time we have a tremendous number of well-intentioned people who would like to improve their own health and dispositions and contribute something to the solace of society. We can then begin to study some of these factors. How do we communicate non-verbally? How does the human being share with other human beings values which cannot or are not put into words? Well, we can again go to nature for a little information or a little parallel. Take, for example, a person who lives alone and whose principal companion is a faithful dog or cat. This dog cannot speak, but it appears to be a good listener. We do not know exactly what its thoughts are, but we do know that in a mysterious mood, it seems to sympathize with our needs. It becomes a close value in our lives and expresses its concern through a series of very simple gestures. It comes toward us when we are lonely. It is with us when we have some problem burdening our souls. It may rest at our feet in a quiet evening, but in some way, the animal gives us one tremendous consolation. We are not alone. And this presence of something means gradually that we build into this presence almost all of the characteristics of humanity. As far as we are concerned, when we speak to the animal, we are inwardly impelled to believe it understands us. 
we share our secrets with a perfect realization that the confidence will never be betrayed. We also find all kinds of ways of pleasing this little creature that has become part of our lives. We may take great pleasure in doing little favors for it, and very often the little animal becomes very responsive to these uh, favors and becomes almost demanding of them. But we do live in the presence of a non-communicating creature that at the same time has the power to seriously and considerably influence our own attitudes. We also find that frustrated care, uh, care or affection come out to the little animal when they do not bestow themselves upon persons. We have in the pet something that is dependable, something that we do not have to deceive, we do not find it necessary to have subterfuge. It simply is a matter of open communication without verbalization. And this is very important in the lives of a great many human beings. Another example is the fact that the body itself is a communicating instrument entirely apart from speech and sight and the other faculties that we know. Dr. Kumara Swami, the great Indian art critic, philosopher, and connoisseur, uh, once observed in his book, The Ministry or Language of Gesture, how in antiquity and all through uh, the life of civilization, gestures have become means of communication. The body assuming various postures tells stories. It gives us various concepts of rhythm. It also provides us with internal means of expressing feeling and thought without verbalization. We know, for instance, as uh, Dr. Lavatar, the famous physiognomist, pointed out, that a person can tell the whole story of himself without speaking a word that also he can share his, con his convictions and his attitudes with others without actually speaking. Uh, Lavatar was able to look at a person and was able to tell by little involuntary symbols that this person presented most of his character and what his tendencies in life were likely to be. Also, we find that... Uh, appearance, a subtle influence, comes from the person, uh, can, which can be registered by another sensitive individual. I remember a story that, that uh, I knew the persons involved in long ago, and that is a bank teller who uh, was waiting to cash a check for a customer, and all of a sudden, he said he knew that the uh, person was dishonest. He knew that the man did not have the account that he claimed to have, that the check was not legitimate, but there was nothing spoken. So he did not cash the check. The man was dishonest, and the bank would have been defrauded. And asked how he knew this, felt this, he said there were little mannerisms on the part of the man trying to cash the check, mannerisms that added up to tension, stress, deceit. And the teller felt it without knowing how or why. So the body is continually telling stories about itself. In India, there are certain character analysts who invite a person to have a character reading. The individual to receive the readings they simply sits quietly on the floor or on a chair, and the analyst studies him. Not a word is spoken for a half an hour or more. During that period of time, the uh, client has moved around a little, maybe scratched an ear, raised a hand, opened or closed a fist, 
shifted a leg, and the analyst has watched all of these movements with greatest care. And from these little symbols, he can give a fantastically accurate description of the person's character. Thus, we do have the problem of this non-verbal sharing of knowledge. Now, it becomes more intimate as we become closer to people. It is very much in experience that we learn the natures of each other. If we are living with another person, if we have children who are with us most of the time, we intuitively come to recognize their moods and their reactions to circumstances. And little by little, we get an intimate realization of their inner lives, which makes it possible for us to work with them non-verbally. We can share their sorrow without speaking, but by a gesture, as Kumaraswamy calls it. We can show a slight indication of feeling, which the other person instantly recognizes and finds it consoling or damaging according to the mood or emotion behind it. Psychology has shown the danger of critical attitudes. It has shown how persons have concealed antagonisms for half a lifetime, or tried to. But the person against whom this antagonism was directed was fully aware of it, although it was never discussed. There was a reaction of restraint, of suspicion, of irritation, whenever these two persons came together. And it was inevitable that these subtle reactions should be communicated. Pythagoras and Socrates and many others in the ancient classical world made a great deal of the dance as a medium of communication. They were fully aware uh, that by various rhythms and motions of the body, the individual expressed not only his physical reactions to life, but also his deepest spiritual and religious attitudes and emotions. The Pythagoreans danced at the dawn every day as a symbol of worship. Worship being the individual attempting to release through his own body the harmony of life. That each individual had a certain personality of his own. Therefore, although they were all dancing to the, no to the notes of a lute or a drum, each one was dancing a little differently. And this difference was a key to his own individuality and to the uh, relation that he had between uh, his own personal life and his veneration for the deities. Socrates, who was not exactly a graceful man, he is reported to have been an, a bow-legged and pigeon-chested, uh, actually, however, danced with his disciples. And according to a stranger who came to Athens, he asked how he would know Socrates. And uh, he was told that, it, that Socrates was a person of very poor appearance, uh, rather deformed. But later, when the man met Socrates, he reported that he found him to be handsome, beautiful, and wonderful. The spirit behind, the life behind, was so magnificent that it completely overshadowed any defect of the body. Now, to a measure, we are under these problems today. Today, I suppose, as never before, human beings have tried to improve appearance. They have used every possible means to make the body more attractive both in clothing and in dieting and in all these ways, they want to look well. But very few of them have really discovered that beauty comes from inside and that a person of very ordinary appearance becomes beautiful by release of internal values. No one can be truly beautiful who is not growing wiser inside. And we cannot have physical beauty that is real 
unless we also have friendship and affection inside the person involved. They must be communicated through appearance. And the more the inner life is ennobled, the more attractive the outer personality becomes. We look over the gallery of the immortals, and the most honored of human beings have not been the best looking. But their appearance has been ennobled by their conduct, and their value to civilization has been increased by the contributions that they made to life. Therefore, we look upon faces like the face of Abraham Lincoln. And while it was not a handsome face, some way it looks beautiful. There's something behind it that non-physical uh, means represents or experiences when viewing pictures of the great president. Now, another way of non-verbal communication is music. Music has been a tremendous factor in the life of the individual. Music is melodic or harmonic when it is contributed uh, from orchestration or musicians individually. Actually, however, the harmonics of music is the result of lawfulness, mathematics, great skill and artistry. And music can be a tremendously vital factor in the improvement of mankind. But only if the music that we hear is alchemically transmuted in ourselves to the highest form of uh, musical vibration. Therefore, we find that discords of all kinds endanger health, endanger the uh, development of character. We must have uh, the music that is harmonic. In Athens, a composer who wrote a piece of music that was not harmonic could be exiled or imprisoned for this sin against the community. Music representing a perfect harmony of sounds also becomes apparent in structures that are created upon musical themes. And these structures include a great number of architectural works. Many buildings of antiquity especially were crystallizations of harmonic patterns. They were deeply involved in music and in the harmony and grace of uh, a kind of melodic consciousness within the soul of the architect. We notice even today the tremendous difference of effects resulting from various types of architecture. We realize that some artistic forms ennoble us, raise our vibratory rates, and cause us to have a feeling of sublimity, whereas others become totally materialistic, comparatively valueless as contributing anything, and bringing no satisfaction, unfoldment, or release of the psychic life within us. So architecture is a very, very valuable and important element in the non-verbal non communication. It tells us much about uh, the ability that we have to appreciate. I think that uh, one is faced with a variety of reactions to architecture. To some people, architecture is simply a roof and four walls. What it is like, why it is there, is purely a matter of utility. And as utility, it nourishes only that for which the utility is intended. If it is an office building or a bank or a stock exchange, then the building becomes simply the structure or principle upon which the building is erected. There is no idealism, there is no overtone involved in works of this kind. Churches used to be very much affected by religious architectural principles. But in the course of time, the attitude of the average person toward religion has greatly changed. Even today, however, I noticed in entering into a great cathedral or some magnificent religious structure, 
that even those who have no particular interest in that particular religion some way become silent. They take off a hat or they do something to indicate respect without realizing what they are doing. They are simply under the pressure of a great harmony, a tremendous spiritualized pattern, a kind of cosmic snowflake, something that is mathematically, psychologically, mystically correct. And wherever a structure is properly organized, it does create a feeling within ourselves. Plotinus, in his essay on the beautiful, has clearly discussed this particular subject. The soul of man is a mysterious abstract power which dwells in the innermost and is lured out into manifestation essentially by beauty. In his essay on the beautiful, Plotinus points out that the beauty in the human soul moves outward to embrace the beauty of the world. That the human soul, being beautiful and symmetrical, reaches out to the natural world of mountains and valleys and wonderful streams and lakes. And the soul is happy. The soul is happy and it is nourished because it is fed by beauty. And having been properly nourished and properly fed, the soul becomes a source of joy, peace, and insight within the individual. If, however, the soul is confronted with a symmetry or deformity, if it, it must listen to discords of sound, look upon discords of color and shape, and live in the atmosphere only of a factory-ridden civilization, the soul retires further and further back into itself, suffering or locked by the fact that there is no nourishment for it in the world in which many people live and consider themselves to be satisfactorily uh, integrated. If, therefore, the person recognizing the fact that beauty is absent from his life, that he is not in the atmosphere of it, must do various things to, com to communicate beauty to himself and through himself to his own soul. He can do this in a series of very simple actions. All that he has to do is find something that his own consciousness tells him is beautiful and try, if possible, to live with it. He may find art, he may find music, but if he finds any form of expression which ennobles him, which releases the finer parts of his own nature, it becomes a nourishment for the inner life and becomes a joy to the soul, which rushes forth to embrace its likeness in the world. Now, in human relationships, the problem of soul beauty is sometimes very difficult to determine. We find this in human relationships, in the relationship of parenthood or of marriage. We find that it's hard to understand why we choose the types of persons we do, or in bringing up children, have certain choices as to how we hope they will grow and develop. Actually, however, there is a measuring rod within ourselves, a measuring rod that asks for beauty, asks for sustenance, seeks sympathy, companionship, and integrities. And where we find these, we are inevitably drawn to them. But if by any chance our own motives are ulterior, and we accept a compromise rather than clinging to our own convictions and principles, then in most cases our lives are not successful. We find that we have sacrificed the greater for the lesser when we sacrifice character for appearance. Because true appearance, in the truest sense of the mystical part of our own being, is a soul power manifesting through a body. Lavatar brings this out quite firmly, and so does Sanders in his study of physiognomy. 
he shows how every attitude that the individual holds ultimately changes his appearance. We do not necessarily understand how this happens, but from the bland, simple appearance of childhood, we gradually mature with other forms of appearance. Uh, we uh, develop various character lines, and according to our characters, so are these lines. And if by various means we have unfolded a high potential, this is visible in our expression and in the organization of the parts of the face and head. If we have conflict inside, it will show in the structure and relationship of our features. If we are not symmetrically creating inward life, we will gradually deform the physical appearance because it must ultimately bear witness to what we are. And the body must be a witness. But if the body is properly sustained by inward consciousness, it witnesses the growth of life within us and is correspondingly beautiful. Also in ancient times, the uh, religious world made use of masks. Nearly all ancient religions had mask rituals, whether they be the Indians of the American Southwest, the Egyptian uh, mysteries, or the Greek drama. All of these systems use masks to conceal uh, the appearance of a mortal actor. The actor was supposed to be transformed by a mask into something that he was not that he was gradually changed into the likeness of a deity or of an evil spirit or of a an, an sub, uh, sub material life of one kind or another. He had a transformation due to the wearing of the mask. Now the ritualism of masks is very interesting. Among the Hopi, Navajo, and Zunis of the Southwest, the masks are, of course, sacred. One of the important points involved is that no one must wear the mask except during the ritual, and the mask must not be shown to other people. Also, the man who makes a mask must never see it himself until it is finished. Therefore, the religious masks of these Indians are made behind the back of the man who makes them. He puts his hands behind him to put the mask together. He must not look at it. Now we find these masks also in Tibet. We find them in uh, the religious rites of the Lamas and of the uh, ancient Chinese theater. They play an important part in the no drama of Japan. They are found in the rites and rituals of Java and other parts of Indonesia. Everywhere the mask cult plays an important part in life. Now the philosophy behind the mask, it seems to me, is, is, is this. Actually, it is a transformation of the personality. And the mask becomes very largely an artificial front by means of which we conceal the humanity of ourselves in a desperate effort to reveal the divinity or else, in one way or another, to represent a member of some other order of life. Actually, almost all of us wear masks. They have become the inevitable factor in modern civilization. We may wear masks to appear better than we are, and there's scarcely a merchant who hasn't worn one for that reason at some time or other. The mask is not something that he puts over his face. The mask is what happens to his face. The mask is the fact that he has a face value that is different from character. That he makes promises he has no intention of keeping. That he makes himself as ingratiating as possible in order to deceive. All these masks also become involved in the kind of life that gradually develops around us. We gain one kind of mask through education. Through schooling, we take attitudes. We come, uh, become associated with certain ways of life, certain thoughts, certain interpretations of existence. Later in professional life, 
we begin to speak through the mask. And our words as lawyers or doctors or engineers are very largely spoken through the mask of occupation, something we have put on that is not the real self. Now, the uh, mystic, of course, and the esotericist is also um, trying to create a certain kind of appearance, a mask. He is, however, attempting to become a, a symbol of deity. The mystic, the idealist, hopes to become aware of the mask of a divine being or a divine power. And uh, as the ritual dancers in the Hopi Zuni rites wear these masks, they instantly become divine and are accepted as such. Uh, I've been at these dances where a father was a masked dancer. His children knew perfectly well who he was, that he was just father. But when the time for the ritual came and father approached them masked, carrying the sacred corn pollen, the children fell on their knees and venerated him as a deity. After it was over and the mask was put away, he went back home and he was father as he always had been. But under the mask of a god, he received a certain divine enlargement of character. Now, we all have these problems also. Nearly everyone has someone they have great respect for. If there is no one in a person's life that he respects, he's in a bad way. He is either keeping bad company or he is overlooking important values. It is far better to always recognize that the individual is wearing a mask and that this mask may cover his strength or it may conceal his weakness. And it is up to the individual involved to find out how these masks are actually worn. Sometimes we wear a mask in order to conceal grief. Sometimes we do it in order to arrange revenge. Sometimes we want to be considered better than we are. But almost always in the end, all masks have to be taken off. And in the last analysis, it is that which is behind the mask that must become the true value of which the mask itself is only a passing symbol. In the Tibetan rites, masks very often represent the types of world in which we live. The monsters of the Tibetan underworld are right here among us. For this underworld is nothing but the material sphere in which we live. Here strange, grimacing, and frightening forms appear. Here all kinds of infirmities descend upon us. Here also the teachers appear to guide us and lead us out of the troubled under life to something better and wiser. And in the ritual dances, all of these various conditions are personified for the enlightenment of the individual. The end of the enlightenment is always the same, that we shall recognize that all error, all weakness, all evil is delusional and that actually behind every evil circumstance of life is finally a manifestation of the divine purpose for existence. Therefore, things wear many masks, but the truth is behind them and the truth is one, regardless of how it appears, how it appears to be modified or conditioned or distorted by the circumstances of daily life. Then there are other forms of nonverbal communication. And these are, among others, service. One of the most powerful ways of sharing life with another is through dedication to the helpfulness uh, which we feel within ourselves to be possible. Very often we have found, as Emerson found, that what we do speaks much louder than what we say. What we say becomes, therefore, a cover, a mask. And this mask of what we say is usually accepted by other people as genuine. This means that we have to be extremely careful what we say, far more careful than the average person likes to be. But by means of character, by means of dedication, 
we uh, create a pattern of nonverbal idealism. The great teaching is by example. The great teaching is the individual doing those things which are the greater good to the greater number. We respect these people even though we do not necessarily have the skill or courage to emulate their conduct. We respect achievement of a high quality, but may not at the moment feel that we can make the sacrifices or adjustments which would make it possible for us to become like these extremely important individuals, so that life itself becomes a form of communication, a form of uh, understanding between the individual and the world around him. Another form of communication is meditation, and in this the individual uh, is communicating with that which words will not affect to any great degree. No matter how loudly we verbalize our prayers or our contemplations, uh, the verbalizations are unimportant. The entire value of the meditative life lies in silent communion with reality. This is probably the highest form of nonverbal communication. It can be directed in three directions. First, it can be directed toward the divine power, the source of all life. Secondly, it can be directed toward an individual or group of individuals for which we have some special regard. And third, it can be directed toward ourselves. This meditative discipline is nearly always idealistic and un uh, unconditioned by material attitudes or interferences. Each person must in some way experience a contact with life, and this experience is the great communication. We call it a mystical experience sometimes. It is an experience in which for a moment the individual becomes an intimately associated with the realities which he seeks to understand. He then discovers what all mystics have discovered, namely that there is no way of verbalizing the substance of a divine experience. There is no way in which the individual can communicate to another the actual experience. Various religious teachers and so forth have written of it, have tried to tell it to another person, have tried to share it with their disciples. But actually, the experience is beyond all communication. It is an identification with life itself. It is an at-one-ment with an eternal value. And this experience itself, of course, has been regarded as the greatest experience of, to which the individual can aspire. Plotinus, the great Neoplatonist, had one or two experiences of this kind. They lasted only a moment, but in that moment, time, distance, space, intervals all instantly vanished. There was nothing but one tremendous reality, and the individual for an instant seemed to tune in on that reality and become with it. This, uh, with Plotinus, uh, lasted only a few seconds, but once having been experienced, the whole life was changed, not only for this embodiment, but for future embodiments. The tremendous experience of universality indicates the final of means of communication. God or deity communicates through a series of inward experiences. These experiences can be crystallized into codes. They can become the basis of religions or creeds or doctrines. They can result in improvements of society and the evolution of human culture. But the experience itself, like the experience of Moses on the height of Sinai, is something that cannot be actually communicated. And in the silence of his contemplation, the Zen monk 
the Christian monk, the Buddhist monk, all have moments in which they feel very near to the realities which they seek. And they have also learned something else, that you must finally decide in your own consciousness where you want communication to come from. Do you wish to have the world move in on you with all of its attitudes and ideals and ideas, all of its forms of knowledge and skills? Do you want to have life a communication from the outside, from the material world about us, a communication which may lead to material success or create more problems that it can ever solve. But in any event, that the building up of knowledge is an experience from environment, from the institutional, traditional forms of learning which have come down to us from the past. The other type of learning is not this at all. It is a learning for which you must prepare by quieting the mind and the emotions and allowing them to become recipient of a power greater than that from external pressures. Now the great problem in meditation, of course, is the danger of negation. The individual, in some religious groups, tries to make the mind a blank, uh, tries to take the attitude that if he doesn't think at all, the divine mind will think in him or through him. This, however, is a dangerous approach to the subject. It is not good for the individual uh, to simply wait passively for some type of communication from a superior source. This passivity is not necessary if the proper background has been built. In other words, that the individual has prepared themselves quite correctly for the uh, acceptance of a meditational life, then it is not negation but quietude, a calmness which is strong and not weak, but which is not associated to the forms of expression which are detrimental to inner revelation. By self-discipline, by gradually freeing oneself from the involvements of an illusional existence. The inner life is cleansed and purified, and a certain quiet order is added. It is a quiet expectancy, a quiet hope, but it is strong. It is built upon self-discipline, the, the, the rejection of illusions, decisions of dedication, which gradually produce in the individual the capacity to receive intuitional uh, information from within. So that uh, this type of meditational acceptance is very, very important in uh, development. But it is not something in which you simply make yourself a blank. Rather, it is something in which you clean the surface of the paper but it is still there and it is something in which you will gradually be able to experience an inner strength rather than an inner weakness or insecurity. Actually, the experiences of meditation are very dramatic and dynamic, but they are very quiet. They are a great peace with, it, with an indestructible strength associated with it so strong that no error or illusion, no attachment that is unreasonable can possibly take it over and uh, misuse the growth that you have accomplished. Now also we have a series of intimate problems with working with people. The physician is perhaps an ideal example of the problem of communication. Uh, recently, there has been a rise in the uh, importance of so-called general medicine, the family physician. For a long time, we had a highly intellectualized medical set situation in which the family physician was little better than an intern working for specialists. 
In this particular situation, we had something against which human nature has gradually revolted, and that is the professional person who has no time, no energy, and no interest in the actual life of his patient. He is there to have his nurse give a shot or prescribe a pill or write a prescription. He is not interested, he is not a physician in the essential meaning of the word. He is a human computer, merely preparing and disseminating certain information which he has learned and which perhaps privately he hopes is correct. This situation has resulted in a great decline in the value of medicine to the human being. And the next step has been the gradual uh, restoring of the family physician. The individual who takes the time to be a friend of his patient, who takes the necessary means to win the confidence and understanding of the sick, a person who is a gentle, kindly, understanding human being. In other words, that the physician must first be a human being. Otherwise, most of his services uh, are less successful than they should be. Many patients really do not need elaborate medications. What they really need is a little sympathy, a little ability, ability to share their problems or to unload a burden of psychic stress within themselves. They are looking for a counselor, and in one way or another, they are looking for a priest. In the ancient Greek re uh, medical religion, the shrines of Asclepius, the god of healing, were for centuries in the hands of the family and descendants of one medically integrated group. They were all priests. They were all dedicated to the temple. They were all initiated into the religious mysteries of their time. They compared their values not only scientifically, but with the great spiritual revelations of mankind. The patient came as to a spiritual father. He came to be helped, to be instructed, to be inspired, and if necessary, to have his character somewhat altered or modified in order to bring uh, peace and help to his life. Now these priest physicians had tremendous influence because they were priests. The individual who disregarded their ministry was therefore violating his religious obligations. He must listen to the voice of the priest physician as he might listen to the uh, voice of the gods. He was in the presence of uh, the initiated, illuminated teacher, not merely a practitioner in medicine. Now again, the diagnosis under those conditions was quite different from what we know today. For the mo most part, the diagnosis was non-vocal, or uh, was not given in words, or by means of tests, such as we would use today. There were no laboratories, as we would call no them, no blood tests, no elaborate equipment, and uh, the individual, therefore, was diagnosed very largely by the gods. At the great temple of Asclepius, uh, the sick were brought in at night on couches and were placed in a circle around the statue of the deity. Then the priest gave each of them a soothing, uh, probably sedational drink that quieted the nerves and eased pain where it was present. The individuals, the patients, then slept in the temple, in the, round, in the circle around the deity. In the morning, they reported their dreams to the priest physicians. And in nearly every instance, the dream was the diagnosis. Nothing was spoken. It was a non-vocal diagnosis. The individual could repeat it afterwards to the priest, but he was actually diagnosed by some power deeper than his conscious mind. 
perhaps as some psychologist might say, he was diagnosed by his own subconscious, or he was diagnosed by his own internal faculties. But the consequence of it was that in most cases, uh, the patient told the priests uh, the correct diagnosis of, the, of his ailment. The priest then administered the material as recommended in the dream because they felt something that we have again forgotten, that, the, that each sickness, each person who is sick, is suffering from a problem which only his own consciousness can finally solve. And all other efforts are to a degree ineffective. They may help, but the final diagnosis of what is wrong with us usually has to come from ourselves. Not verbal, but from experiences, dreams, uh, archetypal uh, uh, visions and things of this nature. Because actually we are the only one in the world who knows just exactly what is wrong with ourselves. Others guess at it, and sometimes the guessing is very irritating to the, to the sufferer. But the final answer lies in the person's quiet contemplation of his own situation. Therefore, in a sense, symptoms are a nonverbal form of communication. Symptoms arise in the person, and for the most part, he takes them immediately to some physician or nutritionist or something of this nature. Actually, however, all these symptoms that arise in himself should be studied deeply by the person himself. If he is not in a position to study, if he doesn't know what it's all about, then he is in a very bad shape because he is living in a house, but he does not know how to take care of it. He does not know when it needs repairs. He does not know when its roof leaks. He does not know how to keep it properly in order. And for the most part, he pays no attention to it. And when things get very bad, he moves out. Now, in this uh, case, uh, when he moves out, he has to wait for a new body. But a great many people will move out on a part of an apartment when they can no longer clean it up. It becomes too odious a job to put things back in order. So with the person, health problems nearly always require or invite very serious consideration. We are the only ones who know the whole story of ourselves. Uh, psychoanalysis tries to help with it, but by the time the whole story is told to another person, uh, presuming that we have told it correctly, which is not always the case, we have not only spent a great deal of time, but a very large sum of money, while somebody is listening to our troubles. Actually, no one, even though they listen attentively, can be all-knowing or guarantee the improvement that we seek. In fact, no one but ourselves can guarantee that we'll even follow the advice that is given to us. Usually, if it is something we do not like, we will not even bother to follow it or we'll start out half-heartedly and forget it in a short time. So each person in the presence of changes in life is in the presence of a great system of instruction by means of which he can improve or maintain health, extend his reasonable expectancies, and cope correctly with the deficiencies which time and wear and tear bring into his physical economy. All these things are part of a great instruction, and the body is patiently telling us every day how to take care of it and what is best for it. In some cases, we are not able to meet the requirement of the body, but in many instances, we can do something toward that to improve the general uh, condition in which we live. Now, art is something I think we should mention in passing. Art is uh, in a rather poor shape at the present time. Uh, I think we will all admit that the art archetype has uh, revealed a great deal of the infirmity of human nature. Good art is never dated. A great artistry belongs to eternity. 
the great principles of beauty are unchanging. Beauty does not talk, but beauty comforts us if we are able to experience its influence. So that in this, the study of art, we have to analyze the lives of the artists to discover the degree to which they are sincere. A sincere artist will produce a sincere picture. A commercialist who is only interested in trying to sell his art does not have the same vibratory communication for us. An art which is shoddy is of no value either to the artist or the person who purchases it because it carries no validity, no integrity, no proper uh, development. Uh, some of the great artists of the world, I imagine, are in the Oriental system. The reason why this is true is because essentially, uh, up to within the last century, the great artistic canons of the East were never qualified or uh, abused. Uh, the, uh, even now, uh, there are many artists in Asia who are sincerely attempting to restore the integrities of the great art of the past. There are a few modernists who under one influence another, some, or another, sometimes a bit of heroin helps, are producing mysterious terrors, passing them off as art. But to the, a large degree, the art of the East is a non-verbal transmission of an inward experience. The Eastern artist uh, tries to live the th art which he practices. If he is deciding to paint a beautiful picture of a mountain uh, with forests and clouds, he will go out and he will sit on the side of the hill and look at that mountain. He will look at it for hours, perhaps for days. In fact, he might even build a little retreat there and look at it for years, trying to experience within himself the message that that mountain has for him. His technique is very simple. All Oriental techniques are so simple that they never interfere with the representation of the value intended. It is no longer a case of a very elaborate palette, uh, no problem of tremendous mixing of colors and long study of conventional methods. The simple line, the simple design is taught for one purpose only, not that the artist shall have a fine technique, but that the artist shall be capable of losing himself in the subject he is depicting. After maybe months of meditation in front of a blank sheet of silk, with a few strokes, the artist will complete the picture. He has digested it. He has assimilated it. He has taken from it every bit of meaning he can comprehend. He has made it an experience of consciousness. And having finally put the whole subject in order, with a few moments, he makes the physical representation of it. Now, as it was pointed out in connection with Seshu, one of the great artists of, the, of Japan, art, artists themselves are classified according to the degree of internal consciousness they have attained. A great connoisseur in Japan, a great art collector in China, is not a person who buys expensive pictures by name artists. He isn't... Uh, buying a picture. He is not buying a label. He is not buying fame or notoriety. He is looking for integrity. And looking at the picture that has been produced by a truly inspired artist, he says to himself, the connoisseur says to himself, aha, uh -huh, this artist has attained the fifth stage of internal meditation. He has reached a certain point and he has put down on this silk actually a statement of himself, of what he knows, what he believes, what he has experienced, and how 
he has been able to interpret the symbolism of this mountain. He goes along a little further and he sees another picture. And he says, ah, this artist has achieved the seventh degree of consciousness. He has seen more deeply than the other one. He has experienced more wealth of inner insight. He has released more soul power because he has the inner meditational quality that has made him a greater artist than the other, although the other artist is also very fine. So the connoisseur will go through the gallery measuring the pictures by consciousness, not by appearance or name. Now it is obvious that under such situation or condition, the purchaser must have the degree of insight that he is able to recognize in the artist's work. Unless the purchaser has attained the seventh degree of insight, he cannot know that the artist has. The connoisseur, therefore, is not a person who simply buys and puts away and put, or builds a gallery to store something. He must have the experience also, for it is only what we have experienced in ourselves that we can recognize in others. If we have not achieved it in ourselves, we cannot know that another person has achieved it. This then goes not only into the world of art and Sumi paintings and beautiful screens, it also goes into the religious art of these people. For the Asiatic has come nearer to being able to make a pictorial representation of invisibles than probably any other school in the world. He has been able to transcend uh, the forms of things without distortion and has bound it all together by a tremendous language of symbolism. Every part of these designs is a symbol which draws the attention of the person who understands. If you do not know the meaning of the symbol, you will not buy the picture. If you know the meaning, and that meaning is nourishing to your consciousness, you will make a great sacrifice to have that painting or to experience the work of a beautiful bit of pottery. For the potter, just as much as the painter, is telling the story of soul power. And a great potter reveals through his work the victory of soul power over physical materials. For he has made these materials become symbols of things unseen. So with the same with life as we go out in, this, in the experiences of living, we recognize in others that which we have attained in ourselves. We may have respect and veneration for that which we have not yet attained, but we can only understand and build into consciousness that which is within the range of our available reflective powers and faculties. Thus, the only way in which we can finally experience truth is to have attained it in ourselves, therefore become capable of experiencing it in other things. Whatever deficiency there is in our own natures, there will be a corresponding deficiency in our philosophy, in our religion, and for that matter in our science. A world that has not yet attained to the mystical levels of things will continue to be plagued by the problems of material existence. We are now in the midst of a, a very sad situation, but one in which nonverbal communication is probably more important than ever before. For it is only by the thoughtful contemplation of things as they are that we can gradually restore our own integrities. We have to learn the lesson in order to escape the consequences of former mistakes. It is not possible for us to listen to people promising this, guaranteeing that, and demanding something else. The only thing that will solve our problem is the victory of soul power over brute force, and until that comes there is no solution. But if this solution is first to be attained in ourselves, 
and we can see in many ways how this attainment is available in comparatively simple people. We find in many cases that those less sophisticated have greater integrities, that in very simple solutions the individual living close to experiences has been able to grow by, in, by actually feeling the way life is rather than listening to experts talking about it. So all the way through the problem of healing and through the problems of sickness, we have this line cutting, a line which tells us that a great deal of health will come uh, from integrities that can restore uh, the imbalances that we have permitted to arise within ourselves. Religious institutions in all parts of the world are restoring religious healing and, the, and pointing out the advantages of more internalization of the uh, search for health. There seems to be no reasonable doubt, and it is demonstrated from the beginning of time, uh, that where a group of sincere persons unites its efforts to be helpful, to help to restore the health of the sick, that they have a great effectiveness if the, uh, the patient is willing to accept the values involved. Spiritual healing is perhaps best personified or exemplified in the story of the great shrine at Lourdes where spiritual healing has been practiced for hundreds of years. Here there is a great difference in the results obtained. Many who have gone to Lourdes very sincerely have not been helped. Some, however, have been mir miraculously aided. And the only difference that can be imagined is the internal quality of consciousness. The individual who had a certain type of consciousness got the results. Another who went even with a strong faith was not helped. It was more than faith that was necessary. It was something deeper than faith. It was the person becoming in rapport with the spiritual power of healing, the rapport of God as health, God as body harmony, God as spirit moving into flesh uh, in the mystery of divine enlightenment. So that uh, healing has become important now, partly because so much sickness is not due to lack of advantage it is now due very largely to lack of self-discipline, lack of the power to have a constructive, creative, idealistic relationship with life. Much of our health problem today is being endured by people who have wealth, who have education, and who are profitably employed, and who have more or less integrated families. It is not the fact that we cannot afford health that is responsible for sickness. It is that we cannot afford internal ignorance. We cannot afford to live below the level upon which health is possible. Health is only finally possible when the individual's internal nature is supporting his material structure. Only an idealist can be truly healthy. Others may be strong, may be vital, may win Olympic titles, but true strength arises from a wise administration of the body by the being within it. It is only when the soul leads and the body follows that you can have the best and most reasonable manifestation of health. It may be that evolution has not yet given us the full power to be all that we desire to be or to correct all of our faults. But one thing is certain, we are better off when our ideals lead the way. We are far better off when we keep faith with the inner life than when we try to live against it and depend upon the crutches and helps and implements of modern science. Actually, wisdom, 
love, health, all these virtues are the result of obedience to the divine plan. The better we obey, the better off we are. The more we understand, the better we can obey. Always there has to be a certain inner growth. This inner growth cannot be perhaps entirely nonverbal, but it is largely so, because there's no matter what we hear, what we read, what we see, the things in themselves are not solutional. It is what we internally do when we transmute experience or tradition or history or philosophy or religion into soul power. And this soul power has to be an internal achievement, usually in the quiet of the night, usually alone in the wilderness, usually under some type of affliction which finally brings us face to face with ourselves and the jobs that we have to do. So in all our problems and in all the things that we have to do to learn, we can read moderately, we can listen moderately, but it's not what we read or what we hear that does it. It is what we are able to do by means of instruction to release and transform our own inner lives. To memorize everything in the world will not solve our problems unless the memory is supporting a major change within our own natures. If we can use instruction to change ourselves, to accomplish the gradual reformation of ourselves, then we are gaining on it. But within the body is this soul psychic factor, above the mind, above the emotions, and above the flesh. This is the natural leader, and when we obey its rules, uh, we will succeed. It will gradually disseminate itself throughout all those parts of our structures, our nervous systems, our glandular systems, our arterial systems. All of these will be influenced by the psychic integrity at the source of ourselves. And it is when this integrity is finally brought into focus and that which is the best of us becomes the ruler of the rest, then and then only do we achieve the health we desire. And in world affairs, when the highest type of our experience becomes the guide to our social relationships, and when the great teachers of the world are recognized as having established patterns which will work, but it is only when the individual outgrows his own selfishness that society can outgrow its troubles. There is no way of becoming uh, good and remaining weak. There has to be strength. There has to be the gradual integration of our total, total personalities. Uh, we may not feel that it's profitable, but it is profitable because in new time, uh, the integrity inside of ourselves will neutralize the pain of sickness, the suffering of ignorance, and the tragedies of misapplied energy. It's only in this way that we can accomplish. And it is the divine plan that this achievement is possible to each individual. It is not something in which we have to wait for the reformation of society. In fact, the reformation of society waits upon the integrity of the individual. Realizing this, we are on the way to getting things worked out in a better way. Well, folks, I guess that's all for this morning.